Okay, so we've talked about bleeding. So now we're going to talk about what you do for bleeding, so transfusions. So Aaron, why don't you start us off? All right. Well, let's talk about packed red blood cell or PRBC transfusions. So packed red blood cells have a shelf life up to 42 days. And the way they stay unclotted is because citrate is added to chelate calcium and prevent activation of the coagulation cascade. That's going to come in later when we talk about massive transfusion and citrate toxicity. Uh, the hematocrit of a unit is about 65 to 80%. And so one unit of PRBCs transfused increases adult hemoglobin by about a gram per deciliter. We talked about in the trauma section how human blood volume is 70 mLs per kilo, which makes it about 5 liters in a 70 kilo adult. And PRBC transfusion has basically no platelets and almost no clotting factors, right? I think most of us remember that type O is the universal donor and type AB is the universal recipient. So let's talk about whole blood and transfusion. So this has become more popular recently. And one of the benefits of whole blood transfusion is that it's less volume. So you get less fluid overload for the same amount of components transfused. You get decreased citrate infusion, which uh, can give you better coagulation status, um, decreased infusion of protein antigens, so less autoimmunization, less potassium because less lysis from red blood cells. And remember, the only approved uh, diluent for RB is normal saline. You cannot use um, lactated ringers because of the calcium, which can lead to microclots. And this slide here, this is basically giving you a comparison between whole blood and packed cells, showing you some of the differences between them and some of the potential side effects. A good reference slide. What about massive transfusion? So traditionally, this was defined as replacement of a total blood volume within 24 hours, right? Now, most of us don't want to stick around and wait for that to happen. So most institutions have a protocol where if you expect to give four units of packed red blood cells within a short unit of uh, time or six units within a short period of time, that that's an indication for the so-called massive transfusion protocol. These protocols use fixed ratios of packed red blood cells, FFP, and platelets. Um, the ideal ratio is actually not known, but on the basis of the proper trial, which didn't meet its primary outcome, but had a decreased early death by exsanguination in a secondary outcome, most of us are transfusing at a ratio of one to one to one. Giving only packed cells, of course, can result in a dilutional coagulopathy. We said they don't contain any clotting factors, essentially, nor platelets. And packed cells have had all the plasma removed from them, and that's where all the clotting factors live. So the primary purpose of packed cell transfusion is to restore oxygen carrying capacity by giving you more hemoglobin, and thus to give you more oxygen delivery. Hypothermia can be a big complication, so if you're giving a lot of product, you'd like to be giving this through a warmer, okay? Microaggregates from RBCs, WBCs, and platelet debris can cause ARDS, and so this should be administered through a 40 micron filter. We talked a little bit about citrate, which is added to packed red blood cells to prevent coagulation. And if you give a large volume transfusion, this can result in bleeding and can also result in symptomatic hypocalcemia. So decreased inotropy, decreased vasoactive tone, and QT prolongation. Um, hyperkalemia can occur from lots of hemolyzed red blood cells. Remember that intracellular potassium is normally higher, so when you lyse the red blood cells in storage, the K goes up. Uh, acidosis occurs with massive transfusion because stored blood pH decreases with age. And then there's this phenomenon called TRALI, or transfusion-related acute lung injury. This is the activation of recipient neutrophils by donor antibodies. This is a, a decreasing phenomenon. Um, it's mostly related to large-volume plasma transfusions. Uh, but if you're giving somebody a massive transfusion protocol, you're giving usually lots of plasma. Okay, and here's a nice reference slide um, that that talks about activation of your massive transfusion protocol. So as Aaron had mentioned previously, um, so if you anticipate transfusing four units of red cells in less than four hours, and your patient is hemodynamically unstable, and you anticipate ongoing bleeding, that would be an indication to activate your massive transfusion protocol. And then if you take a look here, this will give you some other information in terms of dosages, um, some considerations, and then special clinical situations to look for. Okay, so how do we classify transfusion reactions? Well, the big classification is between immediate and delayed. And we'll focus on immediate because most of us aren't treating delayed transfusion reactions in the emergency department very often. So those can be further classified into immunologic or non-immunologic non transfusion reactions. The immunologic ones are hemolytic transfusion reactions, non-hemolytic febrile transfusion reactions, allergic reactions, and transfusion-related acute lung injury, that's trolley. Non-immunologic, bacterial contamination, which actually isn't as rare as you would think, but rarely causes clinical syndrome, 
or so-called TACO or transfusion-associated circulatory overload. Okay, so let's talk about the big scary one. So acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. This results from incompatibility, um, from you know ABO incompatibility, and patients can get super sick. They can rapidly uh, decompensate. Patients can have fever, chills, hypotension. Um, it's technically referred to as a type one hypersensitivity reaction. And um, this can lead to ATN. Patients can get respiratory failure. You can also see hemoglobinuria. Um, there's about 20 deaths a year in the United States from this, um, which, you know, when you think about it in terms of the 15 million transfusions that occur, it's rare, but it can happen. So how do we treat this? So first of all, with all transfusion reactions, right, you're going to stop the transfusion. You want to hydrate these people um, to promote brisk diuresis. You can treat them symptomatically. Um, in terms of lab work, you want to look for plasma and urine-free hemoglobin. You can look for a haptoglobin level because um, it binds to free hemoglobin, so it's going to be decreased in patients having this reaction. And you can also do a Coombs test um, of pre- and post-transfusion blood. And this is is a test looking for globulin antibodies on the surface of RBCs. What about febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions? So this is actually the most common transfusion reaction. It can be really hard early on to distinguish this from an ac early acute hemolytic reaction uh, because they both get fever and chills. There's often an allergic component. This is an interaction between recipient and donor non-RBC components, or, or more rarely it's due to bacterial contamination. Basically, you want to stop the transfusion, support the patient, and then exclude hemolysis. Okay, what about allergic transfusion reactions? So this is due to plasma protein incompatibility. Um, reaction severity is not dose-related, so they can get a little bit of the transfusion, a lot of the transfusion, and it doesn't necessarily make a difference with how they're going to react. This is going to present like any other allergic reaction, so you can get erythema, hives, wheezing, hypotension. Um, you want to obviously discontinue, and then you would treat as you would any other allergic reaction. So you can get delayed hemolytic reactions uh, at about seven to 10 days due to antigen antibody reactions. You can get electrolyte imbalance. We mentioned hyperkalemia from hemolysis and stored RBCs. We talked about low calcium from excess citrate in stored PRBCs causing chelation. That can lead to a long QT. That can lead to hypotension and decreased cardiac inotropy. Uh, you can also get hypokalemia because citrate under normal circumstances is metabolized to bicarbonate, and the resulting alkalosis causes shift of potassium into cells and increased potassium elimination, and then, of course, hypothermia and fluid overload. And then this next slide, this kind of brings it all together. This is a great reference slide that just breaks down the different types of transfusion reactions. Something that patients always worry about and ask about, but is actually relatively rare is uh, the risk of acquiring an infection due to a blood transfusion. So the risk of hepatitis B is one to 200,000 to 500,000. There's lots of people in the United States with hepatitis C. The risk of acquiring that is even lower. So one in a million to two million. And of course, hepatitis C is now treatable, although the antiviral treatment is quite expensive. The risk of acquiring HIV, again, one to one to two million uh, per transfusions. Uh, risk of West Nile virus is extremely rare, and the risk of prion-borne disease like Creutzfeldt-Jakob, so-called mad cow disease, is unknown, uh, but very, very rare. Bacterial contamination is actually most common, but it rarely results in a clinically relevant illness.